Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Invite you to get your Bible and join us today. We're getting ready to have an old-fashioned Bible study here at the chapel. Get your Bible, won't you do that? In our last lecture, we came to Leviticus chapter 22, the first part of this chapter uh, directed to the priest specifically. And we saw the instructions that the priests uh, were not to uh, come in contact with the sanctified or holy holy things, such as the sacrifices, and for that matter, we can go ahead and add they weren't to approach the altar or go into the sanctuary when they had their uncleanness upon them, and that could be any uncleanness uh, that we covered, such as in chapters uh, 15, for example. Uh, after that, the instructions given to the priests that uh, they were to take care that only members of their household partake of the uh, wave offering and the heave offering offerings, uh, which were the parts of the peace offerings lifted off uh, the wave breast and the heave shoulder uh, to, that were for the priest to partake of, but only their family members uh, were to partake of that. And then we came and switched gears back to instructions to all of Israel, all the children of Israel, and pertaining to acceptable sacrifices. And we're going to pick it up today with Leviticus 22:20 20, uh, to kind of make sure if you missed the last lecture to bring you up to date uh, in uh, verses 18 and 19 uh, we're talking about the burnt offerings what was acceptable as far as that verse 20 ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua Jesus name as always father open eyes open ears verse 20 but whatsoever hath a blemish that shall ye not offer for it shall not be acceptable for you and Christ himself presented without spot, without blemish. So again, in these sacrifices, we see types uh, for the antitype, that being Christ, uh, without spot, without blemish. And he became that sacrifice for one and all times. Verse 21, And whosoever offereth a sacrifice of peace offerings, this is shalem in the Hebrew, and it means uh, thanks for peace enjoyed or peace hoped for, you could think of, unto the Lord to accomplish his vow or a free will offering in beeves or sheep, and this better probably translated herds, meaning of the sheep or the goats, it shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no blemish therein. Accepted here means favorable or pleasurable. In other words, be pleasurable to God to accept it. This I couldn't help but think about as we were reading about these uh, sacrificial animals, the requirements on them. Uh, I recalled in the New Testament came to mind where Christ went into the temple and cleaned house of the money changers and those that were selling mite infested doves. When you offer to God, you offer the best of what you have. Uh, he offered a lot to us and sacrificed a lot for us. Verse 22. Blind or broken or maimed or having a win, this is not a usual word or a normal word that we're accustomed to seeing in the English. It means, uh, I think, probably a running sore or an abscess. Or scurvy or scabbed, ye shall not offer these unto the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them upon the altar unto the Lord. Again, the sacrifice is a gift to God, and we should always give him our very best, uh, not the coals of the herd. And those for you that aren't familiar with agricultural term, that means the animals that uh, have problems or the smaller than normal, you're to give the very best that you have when making a gift to God. Verse 23. Either a bullock or a lamb that hath anything superfluous or lacking in his parts, that mayest thou offer for a free will offering. 
uh, out of a vow, but for a vow, it shall not be accepted. The superfluous meaning that uh, it has one member that is smaller than, than the others or larger possibly than the others or even lacking in parts. And, and so we see a little bit of uh, an exception to the requirements that the animals be without blemish or spot. Uh, now that does not uh, go so far as to say, as we'll see in the next verse, that uh, those that are blind or maimed could be accepted. It, this one exception applies to the members being a little bit smaller or larger or possibly a member missing. And of course, uh, the difference between a vow and a free will, both of them uh, being types of peace offerings, but the vow was something that had been promised to God in the past. In other words, it wouldn't do to give a coal for something you had promised in the past, whereas the free will were more of a uh, spontaneous gift to the Lord, and therefore it was acceptable. Verse 24. Ye shall not offer unto the Lord that which is bruised, or crushed, or broken, or cut. Neither shall ye make any offering thereof in your land. All of these things having to do with mutilation of God's creation. Uh, he created things just the way he wants them, and he didn't want man uh, trying to do different things to animals. In fact, as this uh, also pertains to uh, castration of the animals. Uh, the uh, castrated animals weren't to be offered. In fact, the uh, castrated animals weren't even to be cast in the land of Israel. Verse 25, Neither from a stranger's hand shall ye offer the bread or food of your God, meaning sacrifices, of any of these, this word these referring to the things listed in verse 24 above, uh, the blemishes in other words, because their corruption is in them and blemishes be in them. They shall not be accepted for you. This word accepted in the Hebrew is ratzah, and it means to satisfy a debt. In other words, uh, don't give uh, blemished animals to God in, in an effort to satisfy a debt. It won't work. It won't be accepted. Verse 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, and switching gears here, but more instructions concerning the sacrifices, when a bullock or a sheep or a goat is brought forth, this means to be born, then it shall be seven days under the dam. In other words, it's to be with its mother for seven days. And from the eighth day and thenceforth, it shall be accepted for an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And the, within this, the seven days, uh, we see the uh, creation of God was sanctified in that period of time, the seven days of the creation. Now, there was no maximum age established for the sacrifices. However, several of the offerings, uh, burnt offerings, come to mind in chapter 1. The animal was to be one year old. Uh, but there are many offerings that it wasn't specified how old the offering could be. In fact, it was specified in some of the offerings that the offering be, the sacrifice be seven years old. 28. And whether it be a cow or a ewe, ewe being a she-goat, of course a cow, a female, this is referring to the mother still of the animal, ye shall not kill it and her young both in one day, both in the same day. And I think this relates uh, to the special relationship that God in his word establishes between the parent and the young, uh, as it's written in Exodus uh, chapter 23, verse 9. 19, uh, Israelites were not to boil the calf in the mother's milk, uh, an insult in other words. And in Deuteronomy chapter 22 verses 6 and 7, uh, Israelites were prohibited if they came across a bird that was on a nest, they weren't allowed to take the bird and the eggs uh, or the young as the case may be. And uh, again, I think uh, uh, showing what, what God felt about the relationship that should be established between a parent and a child. Verse 29, and when you will offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving, this being one of, again, another type of the peace offerings, unto the Lord, offer it at your own will. 
note at your own will, meaning at your own delight. You know, we get letters constantly here at the chapel from people that get on a mailing list for a church and not Shepherd's Chapel. We do not solicit funds through the mail. Uh, unfortunately, there are many television ministries and churches that solicit funds through the mail. Uh, I call it browbeating because sometimes they threaten that God's blessings won't come to you unless you send them money. Well, you're not supposed to make offerings to a specific church anyway unless you're being fed God's word there. And the offering is made to God, not to some man. Uh, don't allow people to, ministers in particular, to browbeat you into sending an offering. It will do you no good. It has to be of your own will, your own delight, before it's accepted of God. Verse 30, on the same day it shall be eaten up. You shall leave none of it until the morrow. I am the Lord. And this referring to the sacrificial meal of the peace offerings, which we covered in chapter 7, verse 15. This in particular, the Thanksgiving offering in the case of a, in verse 16 of chapter 7, it discusses the vow and free will peace offerings, which could be eaten the first and second day. But after that, uh, both the, uh, the deadline of one day on the uh, Thanksgiving offering and two days on the vow and uh, uh, voluntary peace offerings uh, being two days, I should say, it was to, if it hadn't been eaten at that time, it was to be burned. And the Hebrew word for there is seraph, uh, meaning to burn down as within the sin offerings. Uh, and the punishment, if they did not do that, if they partook of it on the second day in case of the thanksgiving or the third day in the case of the vow and the free will, uh, they would would bear their own iniquity, meaning God would judge them. 31. Therefore shall ye keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. And again, I'm reminded there of James chapter 1, verse 22, where it says, Be ye hearers and doers of the word, not deceiving yourself. For if someone hears the word of God and understands it, but then doesn't do it, they are deceiving themselves. You have to be a doer of God's word. 32, neither shall ye profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord which hallow you. He called them to be his children, his people. He called them to be clean because he is clean. And he's, this is the whole purpose of the book of Leviticus, teaching them clean from unclean as they are about to enter the promised land. Verse 33, that brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God, I am the Lord. Another purpose of the book of Leviticus to teach the children of Israel how to worship Yahweh, meaning our Lord, the sacred name. In chapter 23, we come to the Feast of Yahweh, which were uh, specified periods or dates through the year which the children of Israel were to observe and to make sacrifices to him. Uh, Passover included and, and also the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, as we'll see, as well as the other feast days. But uh, I think the purpose of the holidays, or if we could call them holidays or feast days, uh, was to twofold. It was, in some cases, it was to remind the children of Israel of a specific event that happened in history. Uh, also, it was a day of worship uh, for the most part. So with that, we'll cover the feast days in chapter 23, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord. Now this word feast is moed in the Hebrew and it means a fixed time or a season. And it reminds me in Genesis chapter 1 verse 14 where God said, let there be lights in the firmament, meaning the sun and the moon, and let them divide the days and let them be for uh, determining, uh, being for signs and seasons. And more on that in just a moment. Which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations 
uh, even these are my feast. And all of uh, God's calendar is based on the solar calendar. And as we'll see in a moment, the beginning of the year was the spring equinox each year. And you count days from that time period to know when that particular season or, or holiday or feast day is to be observed. Whereas that concerning Satan and his throughout the Bible, uh, seasons are always determined by moons. Uh, comes to mind Revelation chapter 13, uh, the time that the period of the beast, the meaning Antichrist, will have power on earth is 42 months or moons. Now then, convocation is a word that we're not real familiar with probably, so let's talk about that a moment. If you could think of it as a public meeting, um, they were considered for the most part days of rest and to uh, sometimes a little bit more severe as far as what work was to be done in other days. We'll cover that in a moment. But more importantly, uh, these convocations were uh, a, a time of public reading of God's word. In other words, worship of him. Verse 3. Six days, and this, we're going to cover the Sabbath here rather than one of the feast days, but it uh, sets the tone. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Now, of course, many today argue over what day of the week is Sabbath. I personally feel that it's a, a mute point. In the New Testament, we're told in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, to put our rest in Christ. That word in the Greek is Sabbath. And so, I Sabbath every day of the week. I don't wait for one particular day of the week. In fact, I feel those that uh, show up in church and sit on a church pew on, on one particular day of the week, and then the next day they're out in the bar drinking and raising cane are hypocrites. Uh, that's just the way I feel about it. You should put your rest in Christ every day. Also, uh, make a note of uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, where Paul Paul's excellent teaching tells us to let no man judge us of a Sabbath or a holy day, uh, for they all foreshadow uh, of things to come, and meaning Jesus Christ. Uh, when he came, uh, there was no need for these holy days, and as it's written in, well, more on that in a moment when we get to the Passover, verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even the holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. Now on the Sabbath, which we covered in verse 3, uh, Israelites were not even to build a fire or do any cooking on the Sabbath, uh, as was the case with, with the Day of Atonement as well, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, but there will be, uh, when we see no work or rest uh, pertaining to the rest of the feasts, it means that uh, if, for example, your occupation were a tanner, uh, then you would not do any tanning, or if you were in agriculture, you wouldn't do any farming on that day, but they were allowed to at least, you know, build fires and cook on those days. Verse 5. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Now, uh, at even, of course, meaning at dusk, which is the beginning of the Hebrew day. That dusk of the fourteenth of the first month, which in the Hebrew is Abib or Nisan, uh, that is the beginning at dusk of the fifteenth day. So the Passover actually being on the fifteenth. In First Corinthians chapter five, verses six and seven, we learn that Christ became our Passover. And to understand why Christ became our Passover, I think it's necessary that you go all the way back to Exodus chapter 12, where the first Passover is recorded. Uh, God instructed Israel on the 14th day to take a lamb. Uh, this, of course, all through Moses, and that the lamb was not to have a broken bone type for Christ. No bones were broken on his body as he was crucified 
crucified on the cross. But what were they to do with the blood of the lamb slain? And they were to take that blood and, and place it on the lintels uh, and the doorposts of their homes, their dwellings in Egypt. For that night, the, the, the Lord, his angel, the death angel, would take the life, the firstborn of all Egyptians from Pharaoh all the way down, including the animals. But the blood of the lamb protected or caused the death angel to pass over them, thus the, the word Passover. Uh, in Hebrew, the word is Pesach, and it's from Pasach, uh, meaning to skip over, literally the death angel skipping over the dwellings of the Israelites. And of course, the blood of the lamb slain, that being Jesus Christ, also causes death to skip over us. Uh, why, why did Christ come to the earth? Hebrews chapter 2 2, verse 14, he came to in the flesh to defeat he that hath the power of death, that is to say Satan. Uh, his blood, uh, and we're not talking about death of the flesh here, we're talking about eternal uh, life that in, uh, as it's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, death where is thy sting, grave where is thy victory. Um, he is our Passover, verse 6. And on the 15th day of the same month, Abib, or Nisan, is the feast of unleavened bread, matzah in the Hebrew. Unto the Lord, seven days you must eat unleavened bread. And this to remind the children of Israel that uh, as with Passover, when Moses was explaining in Exodus 12 to the children of Israel what they were going to do, and the reason given, I think, in the last verse of chapter 12, that when your children see this, they ask, you know, why, why are you doing this? And then they are to be told how God brought is Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, and gave them freedom. And as that happened, the Exodus and thus the name of the book Exodus, uh, they didn't have time to allow the bread to leaven and therefore the feast of matzah, the feast of unleavened bread. Seven, in the first day you shall have an holy convocation, uh, Sabbath in other words, you shall do no servile work uh, uh, therein work of any kind, but in this case, the servile work means that it was okay to build fires and to prepare food and cooking, in other words. Verse 8, but she shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. So the total seven days of matzah, the feast of unleavened bread, the first of the seven to be a Sabbath, the last of the seven also to be a Sabbath. Verse 9. And here we see that the offerings being made in verse 8, that uh, goes to show that the priests work on the Sabbaths, uh, whether other people do or not. Verse 9, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, introducing uh, fresh regulation, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give unto you, that being the promised land, Canaan, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. First fruits, always a type uh, for Christ himself and for God's elect. Now, a sheaf, for those of you who aren't familiar you, with agricultural terms, you could think of this as a uh, bundle of uh, produce or harvest uh, grain that after it had been harvested. And then, uh, according to Josephus, too, by the way, it's thought that this was probably barley, and that barley was uh, ready to harvest even before wheat in this area of the world at the time. But they were to uh, wave these sheaves, uh, or even probably better translated, shake the sheaves in the direction of the altar, although none of it was burned on the altar, uh, and it was representative as thanks to God for the, the produce of the harvest that they were about to receive, and this offering or, or waving of the sheaf for the entire congregation of Israel. Verse 11, and he shall wave, and this word in the Hebrew is nuf, again it means more to shake, 
the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow, after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. In other words, after the first day of matzah, being the second day of the, in the seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, this was to be shaken. Um, and more on that in a minute. Verse 12. And ye shall offer that day when ye have waved the sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And it might be confusing to some about the harvest times. And indeed in the spring there was a harvest and it was usually of the grains, for example, uh, barley as I mentioned and wheat a moment ago, whereas uh, oftentimes we think of harvest as the time would, of the year would be in the fall. Uh, this time that we're talking about about here would normally be uh, within the first week of April on our calendar, whereas normally we think of harvest in the fall uh, as a time of harvest, and indeed it was for the Israelites as well in that part of the world, uh, such as the olives and the grapes, which they used to produce wine and oil, and then the part of the olives was in the fall. Verse 13, and the meat offering, this being the minka, there shall be two-tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil. Oil always symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And note two-tenth deals here, and whereas normally that offering would be one-tenth, and this is a sign uh, that they're at a time of plentiful harvest. An offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor, and the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of a hen, a hen approximately one gallon in our measurement, meaning a quart in this case. And the drink offering in the Hebrew is nesek, and it means uh, from nesak, the prime of it, to pour out. And this was to be uh, the drink offering to be made with the minka offerings, which is, is given in another place. For 14. And ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the self same day that ye have brought an offering unto your God, the first fruits. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And all this to be done on the second day of matzah. And again, the, the, read the instruction there given, you don't partake of it and eat of it yourself until you have recognized that without God's blessings, you wouldn't have any of it to eat at all. Uh, this made me think about uh, the offerings of Cain and Abel. What was it about the offering of Cain that was found unacceptable? He didn't bring it of the first fruits, uh, whereas Abel did bring of his firstlings <clears throat> of the sheep. Verse 15, and now we come to the instructions uh, pertaining to Pentecost, also known as the Feast of Weeks, and also known as the Day of First Fruits. Verse 15. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, in other words, the second day of matzah we're still talking about, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. And we're going to see that seven times seven, of course, is 49. And then the day after that will be the 50th day, uh, thus the name Pentecost. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. The Pentecost, that day that uh, from the crucifixion of the lamb slain, which was on Passover, uh, he being the Passover lamb, fifty days later, the day of Pentecost, is when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and they spoke in that uh, cloven tongue that everyone understood regardless of what their native language language was. Verse 17, you shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two-tenth deals. This first phrase means that you're to bring uh, bread that would be prepared as for your daily use. 
They shall be of fine flour. They shall be bacon with, with leaven, notice. And they are the first fruits unto the Lord. And as you recall, no leaven was to be uh, utilized in any offering made by fire. In other words, placed on the altar of burnt offering. Uh, these, uh, this bread prepared for the priest to eat. No, no leaven on the altar, verse 18. And ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year, and one young bullock and two rams. They shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offering, the minka, and their drink offering, even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. All in thanks to Father for a rich time of harvest. Uh, don't you forget to thank Father as you sit down to partake of your meals for the rich harvest that he is blessing you with. Without him, we wouldn't have any of that. And on a spiritual level, we eat from his word and he feeds real well. Verse 19, then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offering. First, the sin offering always to uh, eliminate that sin, and this also made for the congregation, eliminating that uh, sin. Man is sinful by his very nature, but uh, the sin offering making it to where the congregation could partake of the sacrificial meals of the peace offerings and commune in a, in a relationship that they should uh, with their Heavenly Father. Verse 20, and the priest shall wave them them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs they shall be holy to the Lord for the priests and you recall when individuals made pre, uh, peace offerings that the priest lifted off uh, only the wave breast and the heave shoulder for the father and then the symbolic waving back to themselves in this case since it was for the whole congregation uh, the sheep uh, were to be given uh, all the edible parts were to be given to the priest for their consumption. 21. And ye shall proclaim on the self same day that it may be an holy convocation unto you, a Sabbath, in other words. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. Now the next instruction had already been given in, in previous chapters, chapter 19, verses 9 and 10, but I think this inserted here to remind the children of Israel that at such a rich time of harvest that they weren't to forget the poor. Verse 22. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest. In other words, don't reap all the way up against the fence and in the corners. You leave a little bit. Neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. In other words, don't take, after you've taken the sticks and beaten the olives from the trees, don't go back and climb the trees to get the little bit of olives that were left. Why? Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. And I guess that's a good place to stop as we'll pick up in our next lecture with the Feast of Trumpets, uh, which was on the first day of the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar, that being the month of Tishri, which was a very, very special month to the Israelites. Within that month, we have on the first day, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, uh, then on the 10th day, the Day of Atonement, on the 15th of that seventh month, uh, the seven-day Feast of Tabernacles, and, and also a Sabbath following that, as we'll see, to close out the fist festal year of the Israelites. And again, all these feasts to, to remind the children of Israel, one, the necessity of making sacrifices to Israel, uh, two, uh, showing them how to worship him and to have these Sabbaths, which were in addition to the other Sabbaths, and I think that's the reason that it started this uh, chapter with the Sabbaths, that those are to continue. Now, 
the Sabbaths uh, for Passover didn't necessarily fall on the Sabbath day. These were inserted as additional Sabbaths. So we'll come back and finish up with the Feast of Yahweh in our next lecture. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? Our Father truly loves you. I love you because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in more depth. But what's really important, He loves you for that. It really makes his day, and I want you to know that I appreciate you. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. Know what? He will always bless you. But there is one thing that's more important than anything else. That's this, that you stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with problems. you know why? Jesus is the living word. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.